Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Diane Middleton. I'm the Vice President of Advocacy for the Midland Business Alliance, and welcome to our candidate interview. Uh, here with me to conduct the interview, we have Tony Stamas, the MBA President and CEO, and Diane Bristol. She's a board member for the MBA. And our candidate with this video is Mary Draves. Mary is a Republican candidate in the 8th Congressional District. Welcome, Mary. We're glad to have you today. Diane, it's good to see you again. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. So let's dig right into it. Uh, Mary, in three minutes or less, could you talk a little bit about your platform, uh, your qualifications to serve in this role, um, and also what you believe this position uh, entails for you. Great. Well, Diane, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I mean, you know, the MBA has a very uh, soft spot in my heart as I have been a board member for many years, and it's been really great to uh, to be able to talk with the business community continually and understand what their, their needs are. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm here in Midland. Uh, my family is uh, small business owners. Um, we have been for 70 plus years in the, in the area. Um, I went to local schools. I went to Saginaw Valley, did my bachelor's and master's degree, put myself through school, worked for Dow for 32 and a half years, started as a dishwasher, you know, ended up in the executive wing. And two years ago, I retired knowing that I wasn't quite done yet, knowing that there was lots more yet to give, have always wanted to run for office. And I think that, you know, after hearing my kids talk about what's going on in the country today, especially debt and, you know, the idea of their safety, their security, and man, do I have opportunity, mom? Will I have a job? You know, uh, my husband and I sat down with them and said, it's time for me to get involved because we know, and I think we all know that unless better people get involved, things don't change. So um, that's, you know, I got off the bench and said, hey, we're going to run. And here we are today. Um, you know, I think that uh, as a policymaker, I mean, I've spent my whole life creating opportunity. I mean, whether it be in my family business, whether it be in the roles that I've had at now, you know, the opportunities um, to put people to work, giving people opportunities to learn and grow. That's what I've done my whole life. You know, I have dealt with regulation. I have dealt with, you know, government, you name it, I've done it. And I think that makes me eminently qualified for a role like this. I also think it's really important that you have somebody who has a service mindset. And I have that service mindset. If you're going to come into a role like this, you have to want to serve the district, not just, you know, be a Congress person, but serve the district in an intimate way that they understand that you are representing their best interests. For me, there are really three things, and I'm sure we'll talk about them more that are so important in this election. One is energy independence, meaning lower gas prices at the pump, you know, lower cost of energy. The third thing um, is the idea of safety and security. We see a lot of issues with that with, because of our porous border. And the third thing is creation of opportunity, whether that be jobs, whether that be growing businesses, attracting businesses, so many things that we can do to create opportunity. And those for me will be priorities as your Congresswoman. All right. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Tony. Good. Uh, yes, uh, along with uh, the rest of us, uh, thanks, Mary, for joining us. Great to have you with us today. And, and this kind of this question kind of ties into what you just said. You kind of talked from a broader perspective about uh, your agenda and your issues. Can you kind of, in terms of Midland, um, talk about um, three issues, what you would see as kind of the critical issues facing the Midland community today, and kind of the, what, what you would suggest we look at in terms of addressing those issues? Yeah, Tony, you know, sitting on the business alliance, I, you know, I've had a lens into the business community for a number of years being part of it myself. But I think that, you know, you, we are addressing some of the biggest issues, flood infrastructure for number one, right? I mean, that is a huge issue for Midland. We saw that after the flooding. How do we tackle that? Um, there is a plan in place executing against that. For me, that would be a priority also. You know, I think the second thing is, is we're working on is broadband, right? You know, bringing access to the internet to the farthest reaches of our county. And I think this is an issue everywhere we've seen in the district. This is a way, you know, to, to advance economy, gig economy. But, you know, that's the second thing. And I know the Business Alliance does that. Now, if you talk third, fourth, and fifth, there's a whole bunch of different things that we could do on. Um, I think economic development and economic development in the, in the scheme of how do we help businesses grow in our area? But also, how do we attract businesses there? Meaning, how do we work with municipalities? How do we work with agencies and groups to say, how do we attract businesses to our community? 
And I think that's always a challenge, but one that we do really well in Midland and we continue to focus on. I would just add the fourth one in there because I know that we've worked on this a lot too is housing, right? One of the most important things is how do we find housing that is attainable and housing that is safe and housing that is near the roles that we have so that our businesses can thrive and grow. Thank you. Right, thank you. Diane Bristol, you have the next question for Mary. Mary, thanks for being here. Uh, the MBA, as you know, is a business organization uh, focused on business success. We favor public policy that is business friendly. How would you define business friendly? Well, Diane, it's good to see you again. Um, and, you know, for me, business friendly means is, is how, how do we do policy regulation, et cetera, that helps business grow, advance, provide opportunity? You know, I think for me, business friendly things are tax policy. We all know that next year tax uh, policy is going to expire, you know, from the Trump administration. That's very concerning for me as a business person in this community. You know, if I have to pay seven, eight, ten percent more, I don't reinvest maybe as much as I would um, with my employees wages or capital investment in the in the uh, in, in my business here in the community. I think second for me, and this is a big deal for me, as I understand regulation, probably better than any of the candidates in this race because I've lived it, breathed it for 30 some plus years in my job, is the idea of regulation that's not burdensome. I mean, there are so many things that we are regulated in our, in our country. Uh, businesses need regulation that helps them grow and thrive, does what it's supposed to do, potentially you know, protect and, and enhance, but it cannot be overburdensome. We see this in everything from the ag sector to you know, restaurant to even my business. My husband's my business. We sell used cars, right? So we see that in our industry. Regulation cannot be overburdensome. Um, the other thing I think that's really important is the idea of when you're talking business friendly is, is that communities are all invested in moving in the same direction, meaning that we're working to collaborate rather than work against each other, right? Business is a force for good. I think about what some of my colleagues in business do in their communities, how they support all kinds of different endeavors so business is a force for good. And when we say business friendly, we should look at policies to help encourage businesses to grow and thrive and continue to reinvest in our communities. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mary. Um, so to expand on that a little bit, how would you envision working with the business community? You talked a little bit about the uh, the sectors, the industries you you've already worked with, um, but this would be a much broader role, Mary. How do you in, envision working with business? You know, Diane, I, I think being part of business helps, right? You know, we own a business. We actually are working with the business community already, right? We collaborate with others on how you know, how do we advance our businesses together. But I think it starts with one, being part of the community, being in the district, understanding the district, being a business owner in the district, understanding the challenges of business in the district. And then the idea of listening, collaborating, thinking about pragmatic and practical solutions. You know, I think that, um, again, I think business, business is such an important force for good. I've said that earlier. But, you know, it's really about us as regulators saying, look, I really don't know about that. Who do I call and who do I talk to to understand, is that regulation overburdensome to that industry? Is it important that this industry has X, Y, or Z? Will that particular bill uh, inhibit somebody from expanding or, or, or advancing their business? Will that particular you know, regulation deter someone from adding employees? So I think it's really important that you, ha you have to understand what your businesses need and you have to talk to them. The other thing I think that we absolutely have to do as part of the business community and how I would envision work with the business community is also encouraging entrepreneurs, all right? And I think that we don't do that enough. Um, my husband and I are very passionate about this. So, you know, we've done things like put scholarship money against um, entrepreneur, for entrepreneurs at Saginaw Valley, our alma mater. And I think that's really important. How do you say to the business community, look, we have 10 kids who want to start their own business. How do we help them do that? Saginaw Valley has a great program where they encourage and they mentor. And I think that is really important in the business community also is, is that we say, you can do this and we're going to help you do this. And how can I help you do that as your Congresswoman? Well, thank you for that. Um, Tony, you have the next question for Mary. Right. Mary, you, you, you touched on this when you talked about uh, the upcoming tax policy um, uh, that's set to change. 
Can you talk about your general approach at the, at the federal level to the budget? Um, you know, the philosophy in terms of spending and taxation and, and, and that balance uh, that, um, that our Congress is, uh, has to address. Yeah, I, you know, I think there's a few things that all business folks, we seem to all talk about, right? Lower taxes, slash wasteful spending, run it like a business, right? Those are all things. I think that if we're going to invest money, we have to say to ourselves, does that give us the return on investment? So for me as a congressperson, I would, I would approach it as this. We must have a better tax structure, which means lower tax, lower tax for everyone, not just business. We need to slash wasteful spending. If it's not returning, if we're not seeing the return on our investment, why are we investing in it? You and I wouldn't do that. So why should we as a government do that? And then, you know, the third thing is run it like a business. I mean, as a business owner, a balance sheet's really important. And we don't invest unless we get a decent return. And if we do invest and don't get a decent return, we stop doing that and we move on to something else. So for me, those are really important principles that I would approach, you know, how we spend on a government level. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we only have one more question for you, Mary, and Diane has that. Diane? I do. Mary, what issues are you specifically interested in that we haven't already covered in this discussion? Well, Diane, you know, we've talked about my three favorites, energy, right? Because we got to be energy independent. I think under Donald Trump, we were energy independent and we saw, you know, companies have reliable, uh, cost-effective sources of energy so that they can grow. We saw gas prices at the pump. That translates in so many ways to so many people. I think that's number one. Border security. As a mom, I really want to see that border, you know, closed and secure. I think that we have we have too much that we're dealing with already in our country to also have to deal with the idea of significant amounts of illegal immigration. I think that impacts businesses negatively. And I think we need to shut the border down. We need to build the wall and we need to reduce the amount of fentanyl, human trafficking, all those things. Very, very concerning. The third thing we talked about, and for me is the big one, it's this idea of opportunity creation. And opportunity creation is not just about jobs, but it's about you know people wanting to come here to our region. You know, if you look at what are this district, which includes Midland Bay, Saginaw, and Genesee, you know, at one point in, in the history of this country, Flint we had the highest per capita in, income of anywhere in the world, or excuse me, anywhere in the United States. Why isn't that today? Why isn't that today? Because we have not focused on this district and we have been forgotten. So I think that you need a congressperson who's going to go and fight for the district whether it be the agricultural folks in the district, whether it be manufacturing, it be the small business owner, the healthcare systems, to bring opportunity to this district consistently. How do we attract investment, right? How do we work together to attract investment? How do we work together to keep people here? And I think that opportunity creation is gonna be the most important thing that whoever is in this seat, while I'm in this seat as your Congresswoman and focus on it, that will be the most important thing that we do. Well, Mary, it's been so good to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. And to our viewers, stay tuned for our next candidate interview. Thank you, Diane. Good afternoon, everyone. We are here with another candidate interview leading up to the primary election. And with us today is State Senator Kristen McDonald Rivett, now also a Democratic uh, candidate for the 8th Congressional District. Welcome, Senator McDonald Rivett. Uh, I should introduce myself. I'm Diane Middleton, VP of Advocacy for the Midland Business Alliance. And here with me to conduct uh, the interview is Diane Bristol. She is a board member for the Midland Business Alliance, and she also serves on our Business Advocacy Council. So welcome to Diane and to Senator McDonald Rivett. Thank you. All right, uh, let's go ahead and start hearing about your candidacy and uh, what you see ahead if you are elected senator. So in about three minutes or less, could you uh, introduce yourself? I know that's a tall order. Um, sure. Introduce yourself to our viewers, talk a little bit about your qualifications, your platform, uh, what kind of work you envision doing in that office if uh, if you're elected and why you're running for that office? Okay, that's a lot to squeeze in in three I minutes. I know, I know. 
Uh, thank you, Diane and Diane, for spending your time this afternoon. And as always, thank you to the Midland Business Alliance, one of my favorite partners uh, in the way that you all work and how transparent you are. So I'm excited to, to be able to be, do this with you today. Uh, so I'm State Senator Kristen McDonald Rivett. I uh, am running for the 8th Congressional as a Democrat in the primary. Uh, I have been um, connected to the community and to Midland for a very long time. Some of you may know me as the former CEO of the Greater Midland Community Centers. My heart has always been in community. I grew up in a working class family. My dad was a construction worker and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, she went back to work when I was in middle school, but you know, I I just grew up in a in a in a home where we were taught to work really hard, and that that would equal opportunity. So we know in Michigan right now it's harder and harder for folks to be able to make ends meet. When I'm in in the district uh, as your state senator, and honestly, when I'm campaigning through this congressional district, what I hear over and over again is how hard it is for people to find affordable housing, particularly our young families who are just starting, the cost of prescription drugs, the cost of the grocery store. I always laugh, you know, I'm the mom of six kids, I have a 14 year old boy, that kid drinks two gallons of milk a week, right? I pay attention to the cost of groceries. This is the absolute uh, most important thing, I think that's on both the state agenda and on my platform heading into Congress is to focus on getting more dollars back in folks' pockets. Uh, I am very connected uh, to the employers in our district and am very proud to have been named the Small Business Association's Legislator of the Year. I think that there, it is important that there is that we stand with working families and that we help employers do right by their employees, which is something in Midland we are very fortunate to have. How's that yeah. for three minutes? Can I get close. <laughs> I I think you you answered it fantastically. Thank you so much. And Diane Bristol has the first specific question for you, Senator. What are the three most important issues facing the district? today and how would you address those issues? The number one most important priority is to, to bring more high wage jobs into our region, into our district. You know, we know that we have too many families that are struggling to, to make it. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that our median income overall has, um, has been pretty stagnant. So Michigan used to be in the top five in the country, and now we are 38th and falling. So we have to focus on work that allows us to bring uh, additional jobs that pay middle class wages. Like, for instance, the um, I was just a part of ensuring that a package got across the finish line for a um, for a, a DuPont um, a project on the fence line of the Hemlock Semiconductor. That's going to bring 1,200 uh, brand new good paying jobs right into this region. The same is true of what happened at SK Siltron. We're seeing this um, over and over again. Uh, it is possible to use policy to bring jobs into, into our area. And so I fought really hard for that in the state Senate, continue to do that, that work uh, in Congress. Second, I think we really need to address some of the things that are getting in the way of our young families. So I'm gonna first say the cost of childcare. Right now it's between 12 and $14,000 a year. And uh, when I checked around the district, the average wait time for infant care is two and a half years. This stops people from coming into the workforce and it is a um, existential threat to our economy. So we have to really focus on the availability of childcare and all the expenses that come along with raising kids. Mama six, I know. So we, um, so the first, my first priority in Congress, honestly, is to, we need to um, reinstate the child tax credit we also need to re reform the federal funding that comes in and helps uh, lower income families pay for childcare, the Child Care Development Block Grant, totally broken. We have 300,000 kids in Michigan that qualify for this, for this help with the cost of childcare. Less than 30,000 of them actually receive that help because we have made it so bureaucratic, so overwhelmed with regulation and hoops that it's almost impossible for people to access. So that is the second piece. And then I think we have to be very um, uh, disciplined and focused on um, the cost of prescription drugs. So I know everybody in MBA is familiar with what ALICE means, Asset Limited, Income Constrained and Employed. 
this week I, re- I learned for the first time that 50% of our seniors, almost half of our seniors in Michigan are a part of the Alice population. I'm just really tired, honestly, of going to McDonald's for a Diet Coke, uh, into Meyer, into Walmart, and seeing 70, 80-year-old people that are back doing that because they can no longer afford to support themselves. We've got a problem. We have to, we have to really focus on that. And that begins by first protecting Social Security and then also um, working through every bit of um, influence the federal government has to cap the payment limits on prescription drugs. All right. Thank you. And uh, Senator, we we have been hearing a lot about issues concerning the elderly and their their ability to be financially stable throughout these interviews. So that's interesting that you that you mentioned that and we're seeing a pattern. Um, Senator, as you know, the NBA is a business membership organization. And as such, we favor public policy that is business friendly. So I wonder if you could define public, or uh, excuse me, if you could define business friendly in your own words for us. So having run a small business, uh, the first thing that I um, needed was predictability. I think that the ability to know uh, what begin with what regulation and what laws that you are working with, whether we're talking about uh, how payroll is run, uh, um, uh, unemployment insurance, all of these things that intersect with policy in the way in the way you go about every business goes about operating. If that is continuously to swing wildly, that's bad for business. I also think that investments in workforce is are really important. So, you know, I talked about childcare. I think I talk about it a lot, but I was the first bill I introduced was the Working Families Tax Credit. I uh, worked with the MBA to get that passed through the legislature. That that uh, supplement that gives really low income workers a tax rebate that helps them afford basic needs. Those are the kinds of things that are really important, particularly to our small businesses who are often, you know, paying at the lower end of the of the income scale. I also think, honestly, that we have to look at the amount of regulation uh, that is out there and ensure that when we're imposing regulation onto business, it needs to be for a reason. And we need, you know, that when I am um, legislating and when folks bring things to my office, first question I always ask is, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, and I think often we do things that create uh, chaos in um, in the in business climate. Uh, for and when I say we, I mean policymakers in general, because I think both parties do this. Um, uh, I call them bills that are introduced for the intention of a um, big media splash. <laughs> So I, I really believe um, very strongly in bringing businesses to the table. I you know, work very closely with our business stakeholders in Lansing, and we'll continue to do that in Washington. So as we're developing policy, even if it's a policy, quite frankly, that sometimes the business community doesn't like, we should always sit and talk about, okay, but how can we make this better? And you know, that tends to be my approach as I am... Um, uh, serving is to find a way to reach a compromise and to ensure that we have a lot of um, diverse and uh, voices at the table so that our poli- we get our policies right. But again, I'm just going to go back to we need predictability. predictability. No wild swings. All right. Uh, actually, Diane Bristol has a follow-up question to that conversation. Diane? I do. Senator, if you were elected to Congress, how would you envision working with the business community back home? Yeah. Uh, so you all know I have Tony Stamas on speed dial. <laughs> so the first thing I want to do is keep calling Tony all the time. But, you know, I, um, I am uh, very intentional about developing relationships and uh, ensuring that there's a continuous line of communication. So first, there are the, you know, sort of organizations like the MBA, the Chambers of Commerce, 
I work very pretty closely with the business leaders of Michigan. I talk very regularly with the governmental affairs people um, in our large employers, including our hospital systems. Uh, Dow, obviously, really important um, and continuous conversation. But I also think it's important to actually um, be uh, present and available but in our smaller um employers are smaller businesses that may or may not be working through um, associations or, you know, government may, you know, very few businesses have the ability to have a governmental affairs space. It's important to be able to, we do things, we hold um, town halls. I do this thing called front porch talks where we um, bring people together uh, for about an hour and a half and we just talk. And most of the time I spend listening and um, I will continue to do that. You will see me. I, I am very well known for being present in my Senate district, and that is not going to change when I go to Congress. All right. Thank you, Senator. Um, we can't talk about candidacy without talking about financial resources, right, um, and how you would you would utilize those or uh, at, at least work on the budget. So can you tell us a little bit about um, your approach with uh, spending and taxation and, and the budget overall? Yeah. So I think it's really important. Again, I think consistency, predictability is really important. Um, you saw in the state budget this year and last year, uh, that we have been intentional about putting money away because there are ups and downs in budgets and uh, we can't, uh, you can't in a year where the budget is really flush, decide you're going to spend every single dollar of that. You know, I wouldn't do that in my own home. Uh, so you can't budget for families uh, as if you're not accountable in the way a family is accountable. So for the very first time, we developed a stabilization fund, which is the equivalent, you all know, of like a savings account for our for our education budget. That's never existed before. Put, put hundreds of millions of dollars away for that. And at the same time, added um, a pretty sizable chunk to the um, general funds savings account called the budget stabilization fund. Those kinds of things are really important. I um, am very reluctant to support uh, what are called revenue enhancements or any policies that are making it harder for our families to afford things. I don't, um, I think that we have, uh, particularly in a state like Michigan, where we have so many people that are struggling, we have to be, um, we have to uh, treat families tax dollars like, they are the sacrifice that family that they actually are for families, and we need to spend them in a way that are benefit benefiting people uh, and making our state and economy stronger. Uh, and that that is how um, I think about budgeting, uh, and it's how, it's the approach I will take. Now, in Congress, I don't see a whole lot of commitment <laughs> to that, and, and you know, and I, I really think it's important that we remember that these are, um, the, the, this isn't, um, these are families, you know, seniors, um, people's money that's being spent. And, and, and we need to think about it like that. Um, but I also tend to have tax policy that, and believe in tax policy that um, does uh, the most for working people. Right, we appreciate that. Diane Bristol has the last question for you. Senator, we've discussed a lot of things in the last few minutes, but what are you specifically interested in that we haven't covered? So I think both Diane and Diane, you know that my life's career has really been focused on developing strong pathways for children. I, I, I just um, am committed to strong schools uh, where you know every kid, regardless of your zip code, regardless of what family you come from, should have a shot at a pathway to, to greatness. And in fact, I really believe the, the uh, economic viability of our state and the trajectory of our country is dependent upon it. So I strongly believe that we have to invest in our schools and we need to support you know, um, programs that make sure that kids' bellies are full when they're hungry and they have access to preschool uh, and that childcare works. And, and just uh, remember how many kids we have in the country that are just um, often go to bed hungry and are in unsafe neighborhoods. And, uh, and, and, and I think that um, sometimes Washington lose sight, loses sight. A lot of times, particularly in the last couple of years, Washington has really lost sight of what's really happening with families and particularly our kids across the country. 
um, across the state and in our own communities. We see it all the time. So I, I can assure you um, my first priority is around uh, the economic stability and how much it costs for families to live. And But I will have always in my career and will the entire, with my very last breath, be advocating for children in our community. All right. Well, thank you, Senator. This has just been a great conversation and a lot of insight into you as a candidate and the priorities that you have uh, if you are elected by the voters to the 8th congressional seat. So thank you so much for your time. And um, viewers, stay tuned for our next candidate interview. Well, hello and welcome to all of our viewers. Uh, you are watching an interview of uh, one of our candidates. This is Dr. Pamela Pugh. She is a Democratic contender for the 8th Congressional District seat. So welcome, Pamela. And we're excited to have you here. Joining me today is Diane Bristol. She is a member of the MBA Board of Directors, and we will uh, interview Pamela together. So um, our first question for you today, Pamela, we're, we're going to give you about three minutes to introduce yourself to our viewers, talk about why you're running, your platform, your qualifications, and what you see um, as, um, you know, what this what this position would be all about if you were elected to it. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to come before you. It is such an honor. Uh, again, my name is Pamela Pugh. I have lived in the 8th Congressional District for 52 of my 53 years of life, starting off living in the small township, quaint and so connected township of Carleton, Michigan, and then moving to the city of Saginaw, um, going to school at Saginaw High School, Carleton Center for the Arts and Sciences, then uh, went away, it went to Delta College. College, had the opportunity to receive my associate's degree there and then receive a chemical engineering degree from Florida a and University and return right back home and uh, was able to work uh, in actually in the chemical industry a little bit. I worked uh, in DuPont at DuPont um, Paint in Troy and then a little bit uh, at, on the Dow um, campuses. I have received a chemical engineering degree from Florida a and University, a master's of science and doctorate in public health from the University of Michigan, worked 14 years at Saginaw County Health Department, where I had the opportunity to forge relationship between business and faith and community-based organization, help to create coalition in communities, uh, bring in almost $10 million to not only address childhood lead poisoning, but it was also an opportunity to bring um, economic opportunity to small businesses, as well as um, to community people and helping them to be in the forefront of solving issues that mattered most to them. I serve, I am a small business owner. Uh, I was able to work uh, to help forge a, a relationship and coalition across this region uh, around the public health system, which when we talk about public health system, that's broad term from small business to our education system, um, to our local public health system as we know it. Um, with hospitals and, and our public health departments. I also uh, served as a chief public health advisor in the city of Flint. I think what people know most about me is that I am a coalition builder. I am a fighter for people. I have been elected statewide twice and currently serve as the state board of education president. Um, we know that in order for our communities to thrive, we have to have a strong education system um, and great coalitions across the uh, boundaries of our counties. I've had the opportunity to work in each of our counties. Um, and this is, for me, um, this is a pivotal and very critical time that we're in. Uh, we, I've helped a lot of people um, particularly women to become elected at the local, state, and federal level. And this was a time that I felt that I, we needed a fighter in Washington, D.C. for everyday people, for our small businesses, for our businesses. 
And that is me. That is what people uh, know me as. And so I am going to Washington, D.C., and in particular, uh, wanting to fight for the economic dignity of all. All right. Well, great. Thank you. That was a, a great introduction. Diane Bristol, you have a question for Pamela. I do. What are the three most important issues facing our communities today, and how would you address those issues? Well, you know, as I've had the opportunity to travel across this um, district, it doesn't matter what community I'm in, whether I'm in Bay City, whether I'm in Flint, doesn't matter if I'm talking to um, everyday people or if I'm talking to business communities, small and large, economic uh, dignity. And that means that there is the accessibility to resources um, that our federal government is uh, uh, making sure that the resources are getting down to the local levels to uh, ensure economic dignity. And what I mean by economic dignity is that everyone has access to a family sustaining income and wage. And that means supporting our businesses. That means supporting, uh, making sure that we're prioritizing our people and making sure that people have access to quality um, and affordable health care to, um, and, but also we know that this is an opportunity for us again to strengthen our public health system. We know uh, um, that that is important, but our public education system and making sure that we uh, have a pipeline of people that we're producing that have um, are putting on a being put on a trajectory for their best future possible. And we want to make sure that people like me can come back and find opportunity in our in our region and have a, a job opportunity. So economics education, and I will add to that environment. And we have the opportunity to be here in Michigan at the head of innovation when it comes to addressing uh, the climate crisis and making sure that we are a part of the EV uh, economy. And as we build more sustainable, that it's inclusive for all for all businesses, for big and small, but also for the people and that we're not left behind. Um, so I would say education, uh, economy, and environment. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, indeed. So uh, Pamela, you know, the Midland Business Alliance is a membership business organization. And as such, we, we tend to favor public policy that is business friendly. Mm -hmm. Could you explain in your own, in your own words, what you think business friendly means? Well, I know that businesses, the business owners, small business persons such as myself knows that, that prioritizing people is what we all want to do. So business friendly means that we have a government, a federal government that is uh, driving resources to those who can bring about economic relief to the people. What we know is that people want to get up every day and have a purpose for their feet to hit the ground. And our businesses are who help to bring that about. Helping our businesses to create a supportive environments, um, safe working environments and environments where we can see growth, not just in business, but also in people and making sure that people can earn a wage and I'm going to just circle it right back where they can sustain a family. So a government that supports our businesses to support our people. And I would go to Washington and do just what I've done in my 25 year um, career is being a coalition builder, being a listening ear, making sure that we're bringing all to the table to put the people first. And one thing that we know in this region and all the people that I've spoken with, and again, it doesn't matter if it's the pers everyday person to the business owner, that we support each other um, uh, to support 
uh, the people who we serve um, and the employees um, that, that we serve. All right. Thank you. Uh, Diane has a follow-up question to that. Diane? Yeah, kind of kind of along what you were just talking about, if you are, are elected, how do you envision working with the business community? Uh, just as I have in, in, in the past, um, first of all, always being a listening ear, always making sure that the lines of communication are open, always making sure that I help to um, convey, um, be in the center of partnership, but also knowing that in that place at the table in Washington, D.C., that I am being a champion to bring the resources needed um, to bring about relief to our communities. All right. Thank you. Uh, Pamela, it's hard to have a conversation about uh, candidacy for this type of seat without talking about financial resources, right? So could you outline for us uh, your approach to the budget and, and really your philosophy on spending and taxation? Well, you know, I believe in tax incentives. I believe in rewarding innovation. I believe in making sure that our voices are heard. Some of my background, um, I worked with the infrastructure package. Of when I was in Flint, Michigan, we were one of the first communities. We were the first community to inspire the infrastructure package. I would travel back and forth to Washington, D.C. I helped to implement a health in all policies approach to decision makings. To decision making, so as the public health, uh, the chief public health advisor um, was there by the side of then Mayor Karen Weaver. Um, so making sure that whatever we did, we were putting dollars into the local economy, um, that we were putting people first. Again, tax incentives for those people um, and those businesses who are also sharing in those values, um, making sure that we are rewarding uh, uh, innovation. Again, I said that I am pro growth, but, you know, and we need to make sure that that dollars are distributed uh, appropriately and equitably. And that's what most people that I talk to, it's not that they don't want dollars to go over here or go over there. It's just that everyone wants, everyone wants their equitable share. And that is something that I've had experience in doing um, and making sure that I fight for those federal dollars and when I was, at, I'm a Democrat, but when I was going to Washington, D.C., I was meeting with a Trump administration. Um, I will be honest, I don't want that to happen again, <laughs> but I did whatever I had to do to make sure that the people were were put uh, first and, and foremost. And, you know, Michigan has had some uh, good experiences you know, there's the SOAR grant that has been uh, somewhat uh, controversial, but we have seen where uh, we can incentivize innovation and we want to make sure as myself, as a public health, environmental and climate um, scientist, I want to make sure that we are at the forefront of that economy and that all people are able to be included uh, in that economy. And so whether it was me when I was working with the, I worked with the Inflation Reduction Act bill and made sure that the dollars were getting to the people, uh, that when we, when there was the decision that the, that the EPA would, would be, provide oversight of those dollars, that we're also making sure that those dollars um, get to local business and get to the, the business community that can then get those dollars to um, other local business. Again, infrastructure dollars worked hard to make sure that we build, uh, improve, and fortify our infrastructure while also providing a uh, business um, opportunity. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think we just have one more question for you, Diane. Yes. What other uh, issues are you specifically interested that we haven't already covered? Well, we've Talked, I've talked about climate, that 
we address the existential threat of climate change by also being able to be innovators here and uh, in, in address a uh, public health, but also showing that I've had the experience of addressing public health issues, environmental issues, and this climate issue, uh, while also providing business opportunity and economic opportunity for everyday people, uh, making sure that our schools are, are funded appropriately and equitably because we know that that's the future of our workforce. Um, addressing small business and making sure that we are uh, prioritizing small business. One piece that I will definitely say, uh, you know, like when I think about Midland, the culture and the arts and making sure that we uh, attract um, uh, families and workers uh, that and in that way and making sure that we drive federal dollars to our communities that that promote the culture. But one thing that I will definitely focus on as a public health person is mental health. I will lead on that and making sure uh, that we are providing the most conducive and healthy environments in all way for our workers and for our people uh, to have that good quality of life. And you will not have a greater champion uh, for mental health, especially, you know, as we see mental health budgets being cut, um, I will always be a voice and a, a, um, a, just understanding from a public health perspective, the need to take care of the whole, the worker, the whole worker, the health, the environments that they live in, the environments that their children play in and learn in, um, and also just making sure that we can have people, um, our local businesses uh, that uh, can thrive in. And so I would say, um, uh, I would add mental health onto the other components uh, that I've talked about. All right, wonderful. Well, and and you know our communities are very focused on on mental health, so uh, that is a very good fit. Uh, Pamela, we've really enjoyed speaking with you and uh, interviewing you about your candidacy. So thank you so much for your time. And viewers, stay tuned for our next candidate interview. Thank you so much. <laughs>